Well, hi, and welcome everybody to the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. I'm Father Chris Alar, one of the Marian priests of the Immaculate Conception, and it's a joy and honor to be with you as we continue our Explaining the Faith series, and we are definitely taking you back to seminary. I had one of my favorite classes in all the seminary at my Dominican House of Studies Seminary in Washington, D.C., was an elective that I took called Islam. And I cracked out the notes, I cracked out my books and been working diligently this last week to summarize an entire semester for you today. So bear with us as we best try to explain what Islam is, an understanding of the similarities and differences Yes, we have to understand that, but most of all, what links us together, especially Mary. So let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you to send the Holy Spirit down upon us to grant us peace that all men and women may live in harmony with one another. We ask that the truth of Jesus Christ be spread around the world and that we may be the beacons of that example. We ask all this through the intercession of our Mother Mary and through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you. We have a great group today with us here at the Shrine. We are live. We also have a bunch of you with us. And I think it's so important that we first must understand the mission of Islam. And we're going to tell you the similarities and differences, what we can learn from them, what they can learn from us, what we don't want to learn from them, what they don't want to learn from us, and mostly the connection, which is the Blessed Virgin Mary. And I've got a strong video from an Islamic clerk, cleric, I'm sorry, that will explain a lot of this in just a couple minutes. Now, the goal here today is to give you the facts. I am not getting into politics. I am not getting into personal opinion. It's to give you the facts and church teaching. I can promise you that. Now, as I said, we're going to look at both the good and the bad of the Christian approach and the Islamic approach and what brings us together. Okay, so the first thing we have to understand is what is going on. Now, in our celebration of these two faiths and the people, we have to understand, start with the basis of Islam. Now, Muhammad founded Islam in 611, all right, so over uh, almost 1,500 years ago, claiming he had divine revelations from the angel Gabriel, all right, the same angel that appeared to Mary in the Annunciation. Now he took some Jewish mythology, he took some of the scriptures and gospels, and he kind of mixed them all together. Now when he did that though, let's look at our next slide. Unlike Christianity, and if we look at our slide that's on the screen right now, he created a political ideology that has spread mainly by the sword. That map on your screen, if you see the light green, that's the Sunnis. That little dark green in the middle is the Shiites. You've probably heard the Sunnis and the Shiites. I didn't realize till I took this class in Islamic uh, uh, religion that the Sunnis greatly outnumbered the Shiites. Shiites are mainly there in Iraq or Iran. And the whole point of this is even they don't get along. Kind of sounds like the Christians and the Protestants, doesn't it? We both belong to Christianity, but we don't get along in Ireland and other places. We need to. The same with Islam. Now, here's the thing. They created what is many people claim is not a religion, but a political ideology, spreading this this. Islamic mentality through the world, but mainly by force. Muhammad said, and this is his quote, go and fight all men until they say there is no God but Allah. Okay, not pointing this out to cause dissension. You'll see where I'm going with this, to cause and create unity. Now, at that time, Arabs were worshiping 360 gods, why 100, 360 gods, Father Chris? They had one for each day of the Arabian year. 
There were 360 days in the Arabian year, so they had one for each day. So the worship of one God was new to them, just like it was to the Jews. And Muhammad used that whole monotheistic mentality just like God, the true God, the Father, did with the Jews. So we have some core foundation here. And so Muhammad said, listen, there's one God. And he effectively unified the various tribes of Arabia through saying there's one God. But he realized non-Arabs, Jews, and Christians were not as willing to convert. So here's the problem that he had. He spread his teaching through military conquests, and hence we have the perils of the relationship with Islam. Jihad, which means holy war, is mentioned in the Quran, and it is to be fought against all non-believers. Now, that being said, why would you get somebody to fight this battle? How do you get young men to drop everything, come and unite and fight for this purpose. Okay, followers are promised a paradise of carnal pleasure if they die in the service of religion. I had a marketing course at the University of Michigan when I got my MBA. And I remember the instructor, it was not a religious course, it was marketing, it was a business course. And my, mark, my professor at the time said, you know who the, one of the most masterful marketers in the history of the world was? Muhammad. He said he gave young men three causes to fight. One, chivalry. You're fighting for a cause. Everybody wants to fight for a cause. And you're fighting the chivalry of your faith. Two was the spoils of war. He promised that when they conquered, they could keep the gold and the riches. And the, th and the third, the promise of an X-rated afterlife, carnal pleasure. This is a reality, and this is, what, this is what Muhammad did to market this cause. Now, let's look at our next slide, all right? The next slide is actually the, on your screen, a picture of the Quran, and look at that set of beads. First of all, doesn't that Quran look like the Bible? And look at that set of circular beads that they pray on. Does it not look like a rosary? We're going to get back to this in a moment. Now, I had a class in Islam at, um, <clears throat> in Washington, D.C. The professor was a Catholic priest who used to be Muslim. He converted from the Muslim faith to become a Catholic priest. And man, I can't teach you half of what he taught us in that class because it would be a political nightmare for us. But I can tell you what he said in some things. And he said, if you are a peaceful Muslim, and there are many, you're actually not participating fully in the Quran. You're not actually fully following the Quran. He said, because enslaving families of the infidels, taking their women as concubines, as an established aspect of the Sharia, that if one denies, he's denying the Quran and the narrations of the prophet. In other words, he's an apostate. Apostate's kind of like a heretic. So basically, he said, if you are not following the Quran, then you're not peaceful. And um, excuse me, if you're following the Quran, you're not peaceful. I was surprised by this. And this is from a former Muslim that became a Catholic priest. Now, he said, their issue with Christianity is because we teach Jesus is the Son of God. This is blasphemy to them. Now, they are defending what they think is the true truth of God. You can't blame them for that. They defend their faith much more than we defend ours, and there's something to be learned from that. We are told that Islam is a religion of peace, and most Muslims want to live in peace. This is what we were told by administrations in the White House and everything else, and yes, there is some truth to that. This is an unqualified assertion, however, and it may be true. I know a lot in Michigan, very peaceful, good people, 
No qualms, no problems, none whatsoever. But this instructor told us that's irrelevant. We went and we went, huh? The very fact he said that most Muslims want to live in peace is irrelevant. We were glued to him. We're like, what? And he used this example. He said, the fact is that fundamentalism, terrorism, is unfortunately ruling much of Islam today. Now, he used the example, and actually, I'm sorry, this was not the professor. This was another speaker that I heard. He said, a Nazi minority ruled Germany. Most people in Germany didn't want the Nazi minority. They ruled, a, a minority in Nazi Germany ruled called the Nazis, and they killed millions of Jews, although most Germans were peaceful. He said, communist Russia was comp comprised of Russians who wanted to live in peace. Yet Russian communists killed over 20 million people. He said China's huge population of people is almost all peaceful. You ever meet a Chinese? They are some of the nicest, kindest, most gentle, peaceful people there are. Yet the Chinese communists have killed over 70 million people. The point that he was making, and he went on, Japanese. I worked, when I was in the automotive industry in Detroit, I worked with the Japanese. I admired their politeness, their humility, their peace. The average Japanese person in World War II was not a warmonger. Yet, Japan's forces murdered its way across Southeast Asia, killing 12 million Chinese. This trend continues today. Most Islam in the same way is peaceful, wants peace, but a minority group of fundamentalists and terrorists don't. We have to face this reality. Am I criticizing the people? No way. We Christians fall into the same category. We teach one thing, but many Christians live another. So here's what happened. This trend continues today. Over 100,000 Christians lose their life every year for their faith. So right now, all those examples of people being killed, it continues today, especially with Christians. But God is not absent. God is with us he is present if we seek him. Let's look at our next slide. What image do you see on your screen? The image of divine mercy. Look at your screen. This is the answer. Why? Jesus said in diary number 48, I promise that the soul that will venerate this image, what image? The image of divine mercy will not perish. Listen to this. This is one of the few times Jesus talks about your enemy, defeating your enemy. In the scripture, we talk about turning the cheek and, and, and not taking up uh, action. But listen to what Jesus says to St. Faustine in the diary. I also promise victory over your enemies already here on earth and especially our, at the hour of your death. I myself will defend it as my own glory. This image, along with the chaplet and the rosary, is the true weapon. This is the true way. Not killing the people, not warring with the people, not condemning the people, not wishing the people to go to hell. The answer is the rosary and the chaplet and the image of divine mercy. Here we have the means of defeating the enemies. Not meaning enemies as in people, enemy as in Satan. This is key. The enemies of the church can be defeated with mercy. The image of divine mercy, the chaplet of divine mercy. So where do we disagree? All right, let's do the fundamentals here. Where do we disagree? And where do we agree? All right, Peter Kreeft, you've heard me talk about him. He said, as a Christian, I say that Islam lacks the cross and Jesus Christ and his radical love. And he said there are things we should not take from Islam. He said we should not take from them their hatred of other people and civilizations, mainly the West. 
preventing apostasy by murdering apostates, meaning murder those who don't believe in your faith. Don't do that. Treating women as slaves, don't do that. Prioritizing justice over mercy as they do, don't do that. Continuing century-old grudges, don't do that. Fear of freedom, fear of using reason, don't be fearful. He says they have a, a slavish fear of God. They are to be slaves to him. God wants to be father, not slave. Terror, terrorism has caused Unitarianism, the theology that there is not three persons in the Godhead, but only one, and that Christ is not divine, but only human. Peter Kreef says, we can't take that from Islam. But likewise, he says, there's things from us that Muslims don't like either and shouldn't learn from us. We are a bad example, he said, to them. What did he mean? Materialism, consumerism, sex on demand, drugs, addictions, pornography, reason without any faith, redefinition of marriage, embracing abortion, adultery, fornication, contraception, sterilization, euthanasia. We can go on and on. The big one, he said, was provocative dress. Mary warned us in 1917 at Fatima of the impurity of, of clothing and attire. I mean, I'm a priest, but I'm still a man. And when young ladies, 20, 30 years old, come up to communion and they're wearing little more than a piece of fig leaf, this is very difficult. And so Islam should not learn this stuff from us. They're much better in that sense. So what Christians should learn from Muslims? We have a real common enemy. It's not each other, it's sin, it's Satan, it's selfishness, it's secularism, the four S's. Satan, sin, selfishness, secularism. Peter Kreef says, as a Christian, I also say that Islam has great and deep morality and sanctity. He said this should inspire us, even shame us, to be and prod us to admiration and imitation. So you want to know what we shouldn't learn from each other, as I just said? What about what we should learn from each other, okay? He says, you know what we can learn from Islam? Faithfulness and prayer. They pray five times a day. Do we pray five times a day? I'm consecrated religious. We're required to pray five times a day. And sometimes I don't even get to do that. Their devotion to fasting and almsgiving, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, that's biblical. Sacredness of the family. They don't believe in abortion. They believe in children and hospitality. Their families are large. The absoluteness of moral law. The demand to be just and charitable. The absoluteness of God and the need for absolute submission, surrender, and obedience to God. Do you know the meaning of the word Islam? The meaning of the word Islam is to surrender your will to God. We should do that. So you will not find many Muslims who are indifferent, don't care, moral pragmatists, hedonists, utilitarian, utilitarians, materialists, relativists, or libertines. We as Catholics and Christians have many. However, we seem to value life outside the womb. They seem to value life in the womb. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Islam doesn't believe in abortion, and they totally protect life in the womb. But life outside the womb, they don't seem to have the same value. Suicide bombings, killings, terrorist attacks. We're the opposite. Once the baby's born, human life here in the West is sacred. You kill somebody, you go to jail or you're executed. 
I just watched a thing uh, where a little baby girl fell in a well back in the 1980s, and it was worldwide, it was on the news, and everybody was trying everything, risking their lives to get this little girl out of a fallen well, because life outside the womb was so sacred, but yet here in the West, life in the womb, we kill at will. If we could just put together their respect for life in the womb and our respect for outside the womb, you'd have the answer. You'd have the answer to everything. And so we can learn from this. Peter Kreef went on and says, there's one character trait I find in Muslims and Jews that I don't really find in Christians. Spiritual toughness. He said, it is a determination to follow God's will at any cost instead of following our own will. He says, I see in the West that we have reduced faith has become feelings. Boy, isn't that true? Do what you feel like. And the kingdom of God has been reduced to Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. <laughs> That's what he sees. Great saints are not wimps. All right? They are often made up of great sinners. Every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. Saints have been haters and persecutors like St. Paul. Saints have been passionate sex addicts like St. Augustine. Saints have been rich and spoiled like St. Francis. Saints have even been professional trained killers like St. Ignatius. So there is hope for all of us. Saints have to be tough and tender. Jesus was the toughest and the most tender person who ever lived. Mother Teresa, St. John Paul II, tough but tender. So basically, we have two Islams and we have two Christianities. We have two Islams and two Christianities. It depends on which one Muslims follow and which one Christians follow. What do I mean by that? Many say there are two Islams in the world. Those of peace and the Islam of terrorism. The Shiites and the Sunnis, they hate each other because of heresy more than they hate us in the West. It's kind of surprising. Islam has good things like total surrender to God, but they have bad things like the rejection of Christ as Savior, the Word of God in the Bible, and love, not just servitude. But there are also two Christianities. One, we have a Christianity of the New Testament. Love God, love your neighbor. Surrender your will, die to yourself. Do most of us follow that? No. Probably a lot of us follow the Christianity of accommodation to modernism, consumerism, niceness, relativism, individualism. So it's not easy for either side to point fingers here. <laughs> All right, now let's talk about some of the similarities because I'm getting here to the good part, which is the answer to the problems. Now there are some not exact similarities, but they are similarities. Now I want to talk about this. Islam is a weird, filtered version of Judaism and Christianity. It's actually a Christian heresy. Islam is actually a Christian heresy. And I'll explain that in a moment. Do you know every one of the 99 attributes of God mentioned in the Quran is also mentioned in the Bible? Did you know that? In both books... God's mercy is cited 10 times more than his justice, but in a different way. Let's look at our next slide. Our next slide shows the difference. Abba versus Allah. Abba is our God Father. Loving, became, sent his son. Their God is Allah, which is more about servitude. Now there's a similarity and a difference there. But let's talk about the Quran's reference to Mary. 34 times she is the only woman that is mentioned by name. Even Muhammad's daughter is not mentioned by name in the Quran, Fatima. His daughter's name was Fatima. The commonality Islam shares with us and the Jews is called its five pillars. Listen to these five pillars and don't tell me there's not a similarity here. 
The five pillars of Judaism, I'm sorry, of Islam is one, a declaration of belief. We have the Apostles' Creed. What's our declaration of belief? The Apostles' Creed. They have a declaration of belief. Next, prayer. <clears throat> That's their second pillar. Prayer should be our second pillar. Third, fasting. Fasting should be our pillar. Fourth, almsgiving. Almsgiving should be our pillar. And fifth, pilgrimages. At the end here, I'm going to show you a pilgrimage that I'm leading, and I hope you can join us. It's a big part of our Christian tradition. Theirs is a pilgrimage to Mecca. So we have the same five pillars, in a sense, not exact. The simplicity of Islam, together with these devoted people, helps explain its popularity. John Paul II, however, said in crossing the threshold of help, hope, the Muslim's devotion to prayer is a model for Christians who have deserted their magnificent cathedrals and pray only a little bit or not at all. So John Paul II is even saying we can learn from their devotion. You know who I keep thinking of when I think of Islam? St. Paul. God chose St. Paul because he had the most zeal and devotion. Yeah, it was completely in the wrong direction. He was killing Christians. St. Paul was killing Christians. His devotion was completely in the wrong direction. But remember, God said, I'd rather have you hot or cold. This is cold. Hot is great because you're warm to, to God. But St. Paul was as cold as you could get. He was in the opposite direction. But God saw something in him. He didn't go to the lukewarm guy sitting on his couch watching sports. He went to St. Paul, who he saw persecuting Christians. He said, I love that zeal. Not that he's killing Christians, but I love the zeal. And he converted him to St. Paul from Saul. This is important. <clears throat> now, do Muslims worship the same God? Okay, this is one where I, I agree with every single line, every single paragraph of the catechism, every single word in it, because I am a priest in essence, I have to, but even if I didn't have to, I actually do. I've read the entire thing. But there's one paragraph that I struggle with in the catechism. Paragraph 841. And the church quotes it in Lumen Gentium. Let's look at our slide. We're going to put it up on the screen. The plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator in the first place amongst whom are the Muslims. They profess to hold the faith of Abraham and together with us they adore the one merciful God, mankind's judge on the last day. Man, do I struggle with that statement. Because I don't believe they can worship the same God. Our God is Abba, Father, who sent his son and God condescended to become one of us. I always claimed this can't be the same God because Allah would never condescend to become a man. He would never lower himself. He's, he's way up here and we're just servants. We're just slaves. It can't be the same God. And I used to argue this in seminary. This is why I love taking you back to seminary. You, you, you're spared all the time and trouble that I went through. And I can share it with you. So I went to the professor of this Islamic class. I said, I do not agree with this. It's the only paragraph in the entire catechism I don't agree with. How can we worship the same God? They can't be. And then one of the students pointed out, and he heard my question, Tim Staples, a convert to the Catholic faith, said, these are two distinct declarations. Notice how the catechism is written. Muslims profess to hold faith in the God of Abraham. They profess to hold the faith of Abraham. In other words, it doesn't mean they do. It says in the catechism, they profess to hold the faith of Abraham. I went, whoa. And secondly, the phrase, together with us, they adore the one merciful God, mankind's judge on the last day. 
Tim Staples says, the declaration that Muslims, Muslims adore the one God is made without qualification. He said, we can, <clears throat> he said, we can see that Islam links itself to Abraham. This is not saying there is a link. I went, wow. John Paul II acknowledges the truth that Muslims get it right when they profess faith in one God, but he says that they have it wrong when it comes to what God has revealed in Scripture. Hmm, fascinating. They misunderstand, John Paul II said, who God is and what he asks of his people. John Paul II said, quote, Islam is not a religion of redemption. There is no room for the cross nor for the resurrection. He says, however, the church remains always open to dialogue and cooperation because we have a common link called Mary. And that's going to be the answer. So we'll get to Mary in a second. I want to say a couple more things. Jimmy Aiken weighed in on this. He said, the church's understanding is that Muslims don't fully understand God. That's our belief as Christians. But that doesn't mean that they aren't genuinely directing their prayers towards him. They just have some incomplete misunderstandings about who he is. They have error, but it doesn't mean that they don't have a genuine desire for a relationship with God. And with that, you have a starting point. Like Jews, they don't understand that God is Trinity, and they don't believe that Jesus is God. But that has never stopped the Catholic Church from recognizing that the Jewish people do worship God. I found that fascinating. So what he's basically saying is, we as Christians look at the Jews. They don't believe in the Trinity, and they don't believe in Jesus is God. But yet, we believe the Jews worship our God. So he's saying, wait a minute. Islam also doesn't believe in the Trinity and doesn't believe in Jesus Christ as God, but they possibly could have the desire to worship the same God. I went, wow, this is interesting. Some say at death, any who sought God will have a special revelation and a chance to accept Jesus Christ. Are you praying that all pagans who have rejected Jesus because they were taught or raised or shown a different way will be given that revelation when they die and that they will accept it? If you're doing that, you're a true Christian. But I got to admit, even I haven't been doing that. And I remember after I took this course in Islam, I started doing it for a while and I fell away from it after a terrorist attack a few years ago. And I started doing this report last night and I'm doing my studies this week and I'm putting this talk together for you all. And I said, man, this is what we got to start doing again. Now this, there are major differences. We have to recognize that. There are major differences in the Quran, such as that women are inferior to men. That's Surah 4. That men can and even should beat their wives in some circumstances. Also Surah 4. Belief in the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus is false. Belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God is blasphemy. That's Sirah 19. God wills moral as well as physical evil. We do not believe God wills physical evil or moral evil. And God does not love unbelievers. Third Sirah. We do not believe that. God loves everyone. So what do we do? The differences between Islam and Christianity are prominent. Well, you got to go back to the root. Let's look at the first 400 years of both religions. That'll tell you an answer. Christians in their first 400 years were persecuted, did not have political power, and were peaceful. Muslims in their first 400 years were at war and converted through the sword, not love. That's why Islamic reformers who say we want to go back to true Islam, go back to the first 400 years, which was jihad. And so we have to realize this. <clears throat> but you know what you really should go back? Should we go back to the first 400 years of religion, or should we really go back to what the catechism said is our base core, Abraham? Hmm. Abraham is really the beginning, and his faith was based on trust, not violence. Let's look at our next slide. 
Isaac and Ishmael, the two children of Abraham. One Isaac through Sarah and the other Ishmael through a concubine, Hagar. Isaac became the Jews and Ishmael became the Muslims, the wild ass of a man. We can start here. Because Abraham trusted God would spread his progeny throughout the whole world. Even if Isaac was killed, he trusted God he'll find a way. So let's think about this. Abraham trusted God when God told him that through Isaac, who will become the Jews, your descendants will spread as far as the sands of the seashore or the stars in the sky. But he also said, Ishmael. His lineage would spread far and wide. God says this in the Bible, well, that's the Muslims. The Muslims proclaim they come from Ishmael. So this is interesting. Muslims would spread too, and they have. Do you know, I said this the other day, for the first time ever, there are more Muslims now in the world than Catholics. The first time in world history. Today, there are more Muslims than Catholics. The gap's going to widen. Muslims have large families. They don't believe in abortion. We Catholics believe in abortion. We're not supposed to. I'm just telling you, when you're not living your Catholic faith, misguided Catholics believe in abortion, birth control, and small families. This gap is going to continue to widen. And the rivalry between the Jews who came from Isaac and the Muslims who came from Ishmael continues today. And their goal is to destroy the Jews. Now, I want to tell you something that I learned in my scripture class. Throughout history, many people have tried to destroy the Jews. You ever wonder that? Why is everybody after the Jews? You ever think about this? The Assyrians. The Babylonians, the Canaanites, the Muslims, the Turks, the Russians, the Nazis, the Muslims. Why is everybody after the Jews? I want to tell you something fascinating that Father Seraphim taught me. Always going back to Father Seraphim. Father Seraphim says Satan wants to destroy the Jews. I said, well, Father Seraphim, wouldn't he want to destroy all people? He said, specifically the Jews. I said, why? He said, because then Satan could call God a liar. I said, huh? He said, God told Abraham that through Isaac, the Jews would spread far and wide, more than the sands of the shore or the stars of the sky. So if, he, if Satan can destroy the Jews, God's a liar. So Satan's mission has been to destroy the Jews so that we can say God is a liar. This is interesting. Now, Father Seraphim told me this story. He said, do you know that Hitler had 10 henchmen that he handpicked to carry out the destruction of the Jews? They ran the concentration camps, the rounding up of the Jews, the slaughter of the Jews. And Father Seraphim taught me something unbelievable. He said when they went to execute the last of those 10, they were getting ready to hang him. And they put the noose on his neck. This was after World War II. And they went to execute this final henchman, Hitler's 10 henchmen. And as they put the noose around his neck, just before they executed, and I know I'm not going to pronounce this right, I never can, he yelled, Param. P-A-R-I-M. Param. And nobody knew what that meant. And a Jewish rabbi came forward and he says, this is a Jewish feast that goes back to the book of Esther. And what he says was in that book, an evil man named Haman, like Hitler, he had 10 henchmen to eliminate the Jews. And let's look at our next slide. This is Esther. Esther, 
who was a righteous woman. She foiled the plot and she reported it to the king. This is what the book of Esther is about in the Bible. And she reported it to the king. And on the feast of Param, those 10 henchmen were executed in the Old Testament. So here you have Haman, who had 10 henchmen to wipe out the Jews. It's discovered, and they executed all of them on the Feast of Param. Here you have Hitler, who found 10 henchmen to eliminate the Jews, and the last one is executed on the Feast of Param. I went, whoa, this is unbelievable. These 10 henchmen. Now, we Christians are the ones that are persecuted because now carrying on God's work, we continue to be the ones Satan pursues. That's why there's so many persecutions. That's why over 100,000 Christians a year lose their life for their faith. Now, the only options because of this persecution that you will never hear on the, on the news, you will not read in the newspapers, you will not hear anybody stating, but I'm going to give it to you. It's called the truth. If you are a Christian living in Islamic territory, you only have a certain amount of options. One, you convert to Islam. Two, you pay a huge fine to practice your faith if you are a Jew or Christian. Three, you can become a slave. Four, you can leave the country as a refugee. Or fifth, be killed. That is the reality. People don't hear about, all we hear about on our news today is the century-old, horrible, wrongful European slave trade. It's all we hear about. It's what they teach in the schools. But I defy you to find one school that teaches you about the Islamic slave trade. Barbarossa, who was a Muslim, said that he took more slaves, Christian slaves, in one day than an entire year of slaves going to America. Think about that for a minute. This isn't my words. I'm not a racist. Please don't send me the letter calling me a racist. I am simply telling you that the Muslim Barbarossa himself said, I took more Christian slaves in one day than an entire year of slaves going to the Americas. But we never hear about this. The expansion of Islam, therefore, was directly linked to military success and jihad. But unlike jihad, our crusades, which I talked about last week, were not to expand Christianity by force. It was to liberate the Holy Land and protect pilgrims and not to allow them to be forced into slavery. So the Crusades were a direct response to Muslim conquests of Christian lands. But I now want to get to the good news. All right, Father, you've been really giving us a downer today. Let's finish with the good news. Mary. Look at your slide. Mary and Islam. Mary is the key to bring peace and the Muslims to Jesus. Our faith teaches to Jesus through Mary. Mary promised peace at Fatima if we pray the rosary and we do the five first Saturdays. Guess what today is? First Saturday. Join us at one o'clock as we do that. You know, Fulton Sheen, Bishop Fulton Sheen, he said conversion of the Muslims in their hearts is possible. And the answer is Mary. Fulton Sheen, let's read our next quote. Look it up on our screen as Dale puts it up there. Fulton Sheen said, it, quote, it is our firm belief that the fears that some entertain concerning Muslims will not be realized but that Islam instead will eventually be converted to Christianity. This is Fulton Sheen. And in a way that even some of our missionaries will never suspect. 
It is our belief that this will happen not through the direct teaching of Christianity, but through a summoning of the Muslims to a veneration of Mary, the mother of God. Whoa! That's incredible. You know, the Quran says that Mary was immaculately conceived and was a perpetual virgin. Many Christians don't even believe that. But the Quran says it is. She's the only woman, as I mentioned, whom Muhammad refers to by her proper name. And I said not even his own daughter, Fatima, is referenced by her own name. The Quran says the angels declared, quote, O Mary, God has chosen you above all women of the earth. This is in the Quran. The 19th chapter of the Quran has 41 verses about Jesus and Mary. And Muhammad said, quote, she has the highest place in heaven after the Blessed Virgin Mary talking about his own daughter. In other words, he's saying Mary has one of the highest places in heaven. Wow. I want to show you now a two-minute video of an Islamic cleric. This is an Islamic cleric. It's only two minutes. But this host asked this cleric, this Muslim cleric, about Mary. You will not believe his response. Let us take a look. Dr. Shabir, the question we have here, can you explain why Virgin Mary is well considered and even put on a kind of prominent place within Islam? Well, I can say that, first of all, uh, Mary is an important person in her own right. Uh, uh, she's the mother of Jesus on whom be peace, who is a prophet, a messenger of God, and uh, a very important uh, figure in history. He is uh, the founder of Christianity, which is a world, uh, uh, the most major religion of the world. Uh, so it's natural that she should have a prominent place. Uh, moreover, when the Quran came on the scene, the Quran is actually appealing to followers of previous religions. Uh, the Quran is uh, appealing to uh, Christians in particular and people of the book more generally uh, and asking them to rally to this new message. And so uh, the new message was shown to be in harmony with the messages of the previous prophets uh, so that uh, Islam uh, and the Quran itself was uh, shown uh, to be uh, a natural uh, continuation of the messages which were once delivered by Abraham, Moses, and Jesus, on whom be peace. And uh, since uh, the Mary, being the mother of Jesus, had already a great importance uh, in Christianity and especially in Catholicism, uh, naturally the Quran, in appealing to people uh, who already believe in, in Mary, uh, would make a prominent mention of her and also do, would not hold back from giving her uh, that great importance uh, which the Quran can give uh, to any individual um, uh, while reserving the utmost importance uh, for God himself. So in that vein, we see that the Quran says that uh, the angels announced to Mary that God has chosen you and uh, preferred you above all of the women of the world. So it is quite a glowing uh, tribute, Safiya. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. So, Shabir, we're going to leave it at that. Okay, I mean, if you had more time, I just had one last uh, thought. Uh, Mary is mentioned by name many times in the Quran, often in conjunction with her son, but uh, she's also mentioned as a model in her own right uh, for believers to follow. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Dr. Shabir. You're welcome. All right, now is that statement from an Islamic cleric not hopeful to you? My gosh, when you listen to that, you can really see we do have the core base commonality, and it starts with the mother of God. To me, this is amazing. You know, Fatima, Portugal, is actually named, as I said, over, under, uh, after a Muslim princess, Fatima, as we said, was Muhammad's daughter. And Fulton Sheen believes that the conversion will come through Our Lady of Fatima, the conversion of Islam. The Islamic terrorists are terrorists. Did you know this? This is fascinating. Do you know the guy who tried to assassinate John Paul II was an Islamic terrorist? I think he was Turkish or something. I'm sure somebody can correct me. He assassinated or tried to assassinate John Paul 
On May 13, 1981, do you know he is converted to Catholicism? Did you know that? Do you know that he made a pilgrimage to Rome and laid flowers on John Paul II's grave after he got out of prison? Do you know that it was reported that he could not believe that John Paul II survived and he attributed it to Our Lady of Fatima. He said, there is no way this man could have lived. I shot him. I am a trained assassin. I shot him at point blank range. But what did John Paul always say? Mary guided the bullet. It went around his main artery. So this assassin or attempted assassin said, I can't believe it. There's no way he could have survived. I sh I'm an expert. I shot him at point blank range. And he said, it must be this Our Lady of Fatima. Fatima. He didn't know the date that he shot John Paul was the anniversary, May 13th of Fatima. Prophecy is very important with dates. You know, I mentioned earlier the word Islam means submission. What do we turn to Mary for as an example for us Christians? Mary fully submitted to the will of God. Fiat. Yes. She is the model of submission. I surrender my will to yours, God. This is what Islam is all about. Islam is all about surrender. So Mary is the prize example to them. That's a building block, everybody. Furthermore, as Dr. Muravalli, a great teacher at Franciscan said, he says, in her, in Mary, opposites are united. This is fascinating. She is a privileged place of unity. There's nothing more different than divinity and humanity. Yet in Mary, the two were united. So think about this for a minute. There is nothing more different than divinity and humanity. But in Mary, they united in the hypostatic union, right? So he said, this uniting took place in the womb of Mary. So Muslims and Catholicism may also be brought together in Mary. We are a lot less distant than divinity and humanity. If you have humanity here and divinity here and they are that far apart, Muslim and Christians are about this far apart. If Mary could unite this, she sure as heck can unite this. You see the point? That's amazing. Man. And when I cracked up my seminary notes, I'm like, oh man, I can't wait to bring all the viewers back to seminary with me. I would give anything for all of you to be in that class. Because this is what we learned. How come we're not hearing this? How come we're not spreading this message? When I bet you if you explain this even to the radical Muslims, they would say, you know what? I got to admit there's something to that. This is fascinating to me. Now let's look at our next slide. Mary's many involvements I want to talk about right now. Let's start with Lepanto. Anybody here ever heard of Lepanto? Oh, come on, Catholics. Your rosary, your rosary. Okay. The feast of Our Lady of the Rosary, which we celebrate when? Anybody? October 7th. Do you know why the Our Lady of the Rosary is on October 7th? Because that was the day of the victory of Our Lady at Lepanto. It used to be called Our Lady of Victory. You know, when I was high school football, we had this burly football coach, Coach Sanderson. And he used to say, I want you to get out there, knock him down, rub him into the ground, then help him up. Now let us pray. And we would pray to Our Lady of Victory. And I never knew what that meant. I just thought it meant win the game. Our Lady of Victory is winning the fight for Christianity and your soul. 
Our Lady of the Rosary used to be called Our Lady of Victory. It's the anniversary of the victory of the Christians over the Ottoman Navy at Lepanto in 1571. I don't want to get into history. I did that last week. Let's talk about this real briefly, though. The Turkish Ottoman Empire, as I explained last week, had invaded much of Byzantine, much of the Catholic, Christian Byzantine Empire by the mid-1400s. And they had brought a large portion of the Christian world under Islamic law. This was happening. We are seeing this again today. That's why we need to pray the rosary in the same way they did back in the 1500s. They stopped it. There was a holy league that was created. When I was a kid, I used to watch the Super Friends called the Justice League. And I used to be like, that's a cause. It had Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman and Aquaman. And they brought them together and they called them the Justice League. And they would meet and they would fight against injustice. And I'm like, I'm this little kid jumping up and down. I want to be part of the Justice League. Well, the Catholic Church did form it. It was called the Holy League. And it was a group of Christians gathered together against this invasion. The catechism allows for defense. I'm not promoting war. I'm not promoting attacks or aggression or spreading your religion by the sword. Wrong, wrong, wrong. What we are promoting is the fact that if we are forced into saving Christianity, the catechism says we can. And that was my last week talk on the Crusades. Now, crew members on 200 ships before the war began... And you know who one of the sailors was? You ever hear of Don Quixote? One of the great writers, the Spanish writers, he was on one of the ships. Well, anyway, these 200 ships, all the men prayed the rosary in preparation for the battle. And the crew members turned to Mary. And so did the Christians throughout Europe. They were encouraged by Pope Pius V to pray the rosary. And they did. And it prevented the invasion of Italy and ultimately Rome, which would have brought an end to Christianity. This woman I've been talking with online says, Father, I don't understand why you said that last week in the Crusades. Hell cannot prevail against the Catholic Church. And you're saying if it wasn't for the Crusades, we would have lost Christianity. God would have found another way. I said, well, that's your answer. God found a way for hell not to prevail against the Catholic Church. It was the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary in the defense of Christianity. Am I promoting war? No. But the rosary was the key to stopping conquest. This is what Mary said to do at Fatima. Pray the rosary to stop this conquest of communism. And she, she says it'll bring peace. Communism will spread its errors. That's what's happening today. Back then... It was another error. Today, it's communism. Now, let's keep going. I want to talk more and more about some of these involvements in Mary. All right, let's look at our next slide. 9-11. Does everybody remember, where, if you're old enough, where you were on September the 11th, 2001? I worked seven days a week. I had a business in North Carolina. I worked seven days a week, nonstop, kind of like I'm doing now. But I had to take one afternoon to take Rocky, my big yellow lab, to the vet. This was Tuesday, September the 11th, 2001. And I'm sitting there waiting for the vet, and the vet comes in, and we're talking about Rocky. And this woman comes in and says, the terrorist just blew up the Twin Towers and are attacking. And she walked out the door, and the vet went, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Obviously, she's, she's mixed up. Kind of like the assassination of John F. Kennedy, if you're old enough, everybody remembers where they were when they heard that news. Now, let's talk about this, though. September the 11th, God can bring, and this is going to blow your mind, I think. God can win, bring a greater good. He doesn't want evil. He doesn't want it in his ordained will. God does not want bad things, but in his permissive will, he allows them. Why? Because he gave us free will and if he gave us free will, he has to give us the opportunity to choose for good or against good. Now, what was the greater good that came out of 9-11? Father, we lost 3,000 lives. How dare you indicate that any good came out of that? 
God can bring a greater good out of even the worst evil. What's the worst evil in the history of the world? Nailing our Savior to a tree. What greater good came out of that? Every one of our redemptions. So I think back, what possible good could come out of 9-11? You know what happened? I remember. Did you go to church the following Sunday? Does anybody remember what church was like the following Sunday? Well, I'll tell you what it was like at St. Mark's Huntersville, North Carolina. You couldn't get in. The line was all the way outside under the sidewalk. And so I went to this church, and you know there are still people that came back to the Catholic Church after 9-11 that are still here. Millions of souls. God can bring a greater good, as crazy as it was. But I'll never forget what the priest said that day. It shocked the daylights out of me. This is after 9-11, after the terrorists just bombed the Trade Center and killed 3,000 people. And the priest got up. You could have heard a pin drop. And the priest got up and he said, how many of you are praying for the victims? Everybody rose their hands. And he said, how many of you are praying for the perpetrators? Nobody raised their hand. And he reminded us of Jesus' words to pray for your enemies and to pray for those who persecute you. But at that time, I don't think too many of us wanted to hear that. We were too angry. And he says, I know you're going to throw me off the altar here, but I have one question for you. As messed up as this was, as culpable as these terrorists are, and as much as their souls are in jeopardy, they have violated the natural law, and as wrong as what they did was, how many of you would be willing to die for what you thought was the will of God? I was like, what? How many of you would be willing to sacrifice your life for what you thought was the will of God? Show your hands. And like three people. Everybody, I think, was in shock. Is that condoning what they did? No. Is it saying what they did was justified? No. All that was saying, and he followed it up by saying, so please, don't be so quick to condemn them to hell. He said, in fact... Pray for them. You couldn't have believed the feeling in that church. Unbelievable. And I'll never forget sitting there. And he said, this is what separates Christianity from the other religions. We don't want them to go to hell. Yes, they are responsible. Yes, they did something bad. Yes, they need prayer. Pray for their conversion, not their damnation. Jesus said that this prayer is his most pleasing. Jesus told St. Faustina, do you all remember what Jesus said to do at the three o'clock hour? Everybody's going to say pray the chaplet, right? Jesus did not say pray the chaplet at the three o'clock hour. We do it because he said meditate on my passion and the, the chaplet's about the passion, right? But what was the first thing, Father Seraphim points this out all the time, what was the first thing Jesus said to do at the three o'clock hour? Anybody? Yes. You got it. Pray for the conversion of sinners. Did we do that on 9-11? Some, yeah. Most, probably not. I could think of a family member of ours sitting on the couch, screaming. Actually, it wasn't a family member, it was a friend. Family member of a friend. And I was over at his house, I think it was his uncle. And he was laying on the couch, screaming at the TV, I hope they rot in hell. How horrible these people are. This is a baptized Catholic who wasn't going to church at all, wasn't seeking the sacraments, was given the grace of baptism, was given the gift of the Catholic faith, was given faith in Jesus Christ, and let it waste away. 
For 25 years, he had not been to church, the sacraments, confession, communion. I'm sorry to say, but I believe his soul may be just as much in jeopardy, if not more. Because who was given much more? To whom much is given, much is expected. Pagans weren't given the gift of the Catholic faith. They weren't given it. We are. Do not waste it. This is something to be aware of. All right. So I want to finish with 9-11 because this is, this is very powerful. All right. Saints tell us you'll be surprised at who is in heaven and who is not. Do you hear that? Saints tell us you'll be really surprised who's in heaven and who is not. Now, I, I think this is a little fascinating sidebar. Do you know why the terrorists picked September 11th? Do you think it was just a random day? Oh, no. It was very calculated. September the 11th was picked because it was the highest point of Islamic power in history. September the 11th, 1683. It was the height of Islamic power. They were on the verge of conquering all of Europe. And the next day, look on your screen, was a battle you've probably never heard of that saved the world. It's called the Battle of Vienna. Vienna, Austria. The next day, September the 12th, Islam's reign was over. Through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who they prayed to, they were conquered on their attack of Vienna. After assuming that they would take Vienna, the Muslim Sultan said his next step, there's nothing stopping us to take St. Peter's. Once we take Vienna, there's nothing stopping us. World domination, the end of Christianity. The battle marked the end of the expansion of Islam in Europe. How? Because a little ragtag group of Christians defeated what to some say was up to 300,000 Muslims. And it was from this victory that we celebrate the holy name of Mary. The holy name of Mary, why? Because no nation would step up except a little guy from Poland named Jan Sobieski. My dad declared him his new hero. My dad never even heard of him. We're learning all this garbage in schools. Never do we learn about who Jan Sobieski was. A Polish general who stepped up and entrusted the battle and led a cavalry from Poland in the name of Mary, shouting, Our Lady of Czestochowa. <laughs> Can you imagine? What a battle cry. Our Lady of Czestochowa. And what happened? The Pope and the European leaders hailed Jan Sobieski as, quote, the savior of Western civilization. This is what they claimed happened. The day... September the 12th, 1683. Why did the Muslims choose September 11th? Because the day before they were at the height of their power and they said, we are now going to return to the height of our power. September the 11th, 2001. Now, the day was commemorated in Vienna by creating a new pastry called a croissant. Let's look at our next slide. Here you have a picture of a croissant circular shape next to the Islamic flag, a circular shape with a star. Now, Marie Antoinette, y'all hear, isn't she the one that said, let us eat cake or let them eat cake or something? She introduced the croissant to France. Everybody thinks it's French. She brought it to France in 1770. She was born in Vienna. Marie Antoinette was not born in France. She was born in Vienna. The croissant is not French, it's from Vienna after the battle because it was the conquering of the Islamic symbol of the semicircle.
It was eaten along with coffee, get a load of this, which they found in the abandoned tents of the Muslims. The Europeans had never tasted coffee. That's till 1683, and then they found coffee in the abandoned tents of the, of the Turks. And Sobieski, the winner of the battle, found these bags of coffee beans, revealing, wondering how the Turks could fight day and night. They were living on caffeine. So he's wondering how the Turks could fight day and night. They could fight day and night because they were drinking this coffee. So this coffee, these coffee beans actually came from Ethiopia, the one African country which remained Christian. So the Muslims called the infidels, the Christians, kafir. They called them kafir, which means infidel. And that's how we get the word coffee. Isn't that interesting? So Christian roots are everywhere. Legend has it that Pope Clement VIII was told to declare the coffee was the drink of the devil. And so he ready to declare it the drink of the devil because it came from the Islamics, uh, the Muslims. And so they gave it to him. He says, declare this a drink of the devil. And he tasted it. And he said, the devil's drink is so good, we need to cheat the devil by baptizing it. <laughs> and making it our own. Isn't that the Catholic way? That's hilarious. So after the victory of Vienna, a Polish general opened the first coffee house. This is why Vienna is known as the world's greatest location of coffee. This is fascinating. Our Christian roots run so deep. Now it doesn't stop there. Mary keeps involved, but I only got a few minutes left. Thank you for your patience, everybody. I know you're getting antsy, but we only got just about a few minutes left. Let's look at our next slide. Later, Barbary pirates were attacking U.S. ships. Look at that scene there. Those are U.S. sailors being enslaved by Muslim pirates. And they were attacking U.S. ships and taking Americans as slaves. This is why, let's look at our next slide, Thomas Jefferson created the United States Marine Corps in 1775. My dad and his buddies, my dad's a Vietnam Marine, still celebrate the birthday of the Marine Corps at a pub in Philadelphia in 1775. Guess what the Marine Corps hymn is? From the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, we will fight our country's battles on the air and in the air and the land and the sea. From the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, that was protection of Islamic pirates. The shores of Tripoli. And so the United States even has a hand in this history. The ambassador to the United States, quote, said, because they said, stop attacking and enslaving our sailors. Thomas Jefferson, God bless him, we need more like Thomas Jefferson today, and yet we're writing him out of the history books. I get so upset with that, I got to go to confession. And so Thomas Jefferson's being written out of the history books, and he had had enough when the ambassador, the Islamic ambassador said, quote, it is written in the Quran. This is what he told the United States, that all nations who don't acknowledge our authority are sinners. That is our right and duty to make war upon them, whoever they could be, wherever they could be found, and to make slaves of them all that we can take as prisoners. So they justified taking the United States sailors as slaves, and Thomas Jefferson said, that's it. And he founded the United States Marine Corps. God bless all of you who have served for justice and the protection of freedom. So what happened? Mary doesn't stop. At the break, I told everybody here that Mary is so into this that she even appeared on television. What are you talking about, Father? 1968. Mary appeared in Zetum, Egypt, 
hovering above St. Mark's Coptic Church. She was there. 1968, especially at night, everybody could see her. It wasn't just visionaries like a few people at Fatima, a few children or Medjugorje. The church that she appeared on is believed to be the same place that Mary and Joseph and Jesus stopped at their flight into Egypt. This church is dedicated to the Holy Family. And the reason this church is dedicated to the Holy Family is because, again, they believe Mary, Joseph, and Jesus went there and rested during their stay in Egypt. That's why they built this church to the Holy Family. And this is where Mary appeared on the church. So let's look at our next slide. I'm sorry, I'm going to try to show everybody here if I can show it. Um, I don't know if everybody here, but uh, on our screen, if Dale can see, that's actually, I don't know if you all can see it, but it'll be on our website tonight on my talk on this on YouTube. But you can see Mary very clearly appearing on the top of this church. Now what's fascinating is Christians, Jews, Muslims, they all saw her, even unbelievers. Even unbelievers saw her. She was up there, and it was broadcast on television. Why are we not learning this? Why are we not being told this even in our own church? How many people have heard a homily on this? How many people have heard a bishop talk about this? All I've heard some bishops say is that we got to capitulate, and we have to stop our Christian ways. No, we don't. We have to live the gospel. And Mary's going to help us do that if we live Virtuously. So an estimated 40 million people saw her. 40 million. And the apparition was approved by the Orthodox Pope. Because this was over an Orthodox church. So unlike other apparitions, it was not just visionaries, but everyone saw her. This is fascinating. It doesn't stop there. In 2014... Boko Haram, Muslim terrorists, took 200 young girls in Nigeria. You might remember this. And a Catholic bishop was ready to take up arms, to condone it. And he had a vision that Jesus appeared to this Catholic bishop in Nigeria. And Jesus was holding a sword. And the bishop's like, yes. Yes. And he reached his hands out, and Jesus handed the sword to this bishop. And the bishop took the sword, and it turned into a rosary in his hands. It turned into a rosary. And so this is an example. And he said the rosary was the weapon to overcome Boko Haram. After that, most of those girls released and Boko Haram surrendered. We have a priest that's maybe coming back, but he had to go back to Nigeria named Father Richard. I don't know if you ever saw him when he was there. I think Mary here saw him and remembers him. The nicest guy in the world. I went to him for confession. You ever want to go to one of the best confessors ever? Go to Father Richard from Nigeria. He's not here now, but you basically could tell him anything and he would be like seeing the good in it. I'm like, my goodness. And Father Richard was telling a story. It's one of the most incredible things. We have a new YouTube, uh, EWTN series starting September 1st. I invite all of you to tune in. Every Wednesday at 6.30, I'll be hosting a new show on EWTN with my Marian Priest and brothers. And we're trying to get Father Richard. He's going to be a guest on one of those shows. He's going to tell this story. Father Richard told me the story that he was celebrating Mass in Nigeria. And he was celebrating Mass, and in walked a dozen Islamic terrorists strapped with explosives. They were going to blow up the church. This happens regularly. You don't hear about it. And he was going to strap it, the explosives, and to blow up the church. All of a sudden, the leader fell to his knees, and he went into a trance. Now, all his other assistants were around him, 
And all of these others that were ready to participate in the explosion of the church were prepared to give their life for what they thought was the will of God. No, wrong, 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 violates the natural law. But this guy fell to his knees and he went into a trance, Father Richard said. And all of a sudden he stood up and his partners are all looking at him and he goes, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. They're like, huh? He had a vision of Jesus and Mary. And Jesus showed him his divinity. And Mary took his hand and led him to Jesus. This is our whole faith to Jesus through Mary. And he got up and he told all the others that were ready to blow up this church that Jesus is God and Mary is the way to him. And they all converted. Why don't we hear about this? If we heard about this, this is the purpose of why I'm teaching you to take you back to seminary so that we can understand, yeah, there's fundamental differences, but look at the connection. There's hope, but we got to pray. We got to believe. We got to have faith. I want to show this next slide. Fulton Sheen suggests that Mary's apparitions in Fatima will play a major role in the conversion of Islam. Our Lady of Fatima, Queen of the Muslims. That's what Fulton Sheen said. That's incredible. Our Lady of Fatima, Queen of the Muslims. Wow. Can you imagine if humanity came together like that? Is that the triumph of the Immaculate Heart? Wow. So, Fulton Sheen suggests this. He says, many Muslims already pray on a string of beads. Did you know this? Fulton Sheen pointed out that Muslims pray on a string of beads that looks very similar to the rosary. Let's look at our next slide. I already pointed this out earlier, but I want to point it out again. Doesn't that look like the rosary? That's the Muslim string of beads on the Quran, which looks like the Bible. This is not truth. The Bible and the rosary is the truth. Please don't send me the letter, Father. You're justifying the Quran and the Muslim like bees. No, I am not. I'm trying to say that Mary and God will meet you where you're at and get you to where you need to go. That's why Mary appeared to the Mexicans as an Aztec. She met them where they were at and took them where they needed to go. She was dressed that way. And I'll get to her in a moment, but I want to talk about this. This string of beads they pray on, do you know that the mysteries of the rosary are actually in the Quran? The Annunciation, the Visitation, the Nativity, it's all in the Quran. They're already praying this. And I'm almost done. I know I keep telling you I'm almost done. I'm almost done. The exchange of the Muslim prayer beads for the rosary will be an easy one. They already pray on these beads. It'll be easy to switch out to the rosary. There must be a reason why God has allowed Islam to flourish and spread all over the globe. Is God planning a wonderful event for our times, an event that would lead an entire religion to God, kind of like the Catholicism in Guadalupe? All the Aztecs were led to God. Millions were affected. I don't know, but let's look at our last couple slides. This is why Mary appears in the culture as an Aztec. This is Our Lady of Guadalupe. Maybe, can we please turn our cell phones off, please? Mary in the Quran is a Muslim girl. And this is why many Catholics and Christians say, well, that makes it invalid. Yes, in a way it does. It's not how we understand Mary. But again, God will meet you where you're at. If to the Muslims, Mary being a Muslim gets them to open their eyes and then she takes them where they got to go to Jesus Christ, she did just what she did with the Aztecs in Guadalupe. She met him as an Aztec, dressed as an Aztec, but then took him to Jesus Christ. This is fascinating. This makes sense. Mary in the Quran is a Muslim and many criticize it, but it could be the key. Until then, we need to pray for Mary's intercession. And that's where I want to finish with two quotes that I think I need to leave you with today. They're two slides. I'm going to read them to you, these two quotes, and we are done. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, the first quote is what St. Faustina said Jesus said to her. Quote, my pupil. Isn't that beautiful? That's what I'm saying you guys are right now. You guys are pupils. You're going back to seminary. You're learning about your faith so you can love God more. My pupil, have great love for those who cause you suffering. Do good to those who hate you. I answered, oh, my master, you see very well that I feel no love for them. And that troubles me. So Faustina herself is saying, I can't love someone who hates me. You think Faustina's perfect? Here she just showed her, she's not. Jesus answered, it is not always within your power to control your feelings. So don't get discouraged if you don't feel like praying, make an act of the will. That's what love is, not a feeling, an act of the will. You will recognize that you have love if, after having experienced annoyance <laughs> and contradiction, you do not lose your peace, but pray for those who have made you suffer and wish them well. Diary 1628, wow. And then the last slide is the Bible. Jesus says in Matthew chapter five, you shall love your neighbor, you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your heavenly father. For he makes his son, S-U-N, rise on the bad and the good and causes rain to fall on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what recompense will you have? Do not tax collectors and pagans do the same? So be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Father, I can't do that. It's not natural. You're exactly right. It's supernatural. God bless you. Thank you all so much for going back to seminary with us. You got a lot to learn today, so I'm not going to have Dale run an, an ad at the end on any book or anything like that. We're just going to stop the video. But I do want to give you an opportunity, if you wish, to get a few things. We do have my uh, DVD where I do my talks on shopmercy.org. You can see it's called Explaining the Faith. I don't know if Dale has that up. So please visit shopmercy.org or call us at 800 4 marian M-A-R-I-A-N. Next is my book called Understanding Divine Mercy. I talk a lot about this in that book. You can get that for any donation. Just visit thedivinemercy.org slash U-D for understanding divine mercy. Any donation, a dollar, it's all I got, Father, take it, give it, whatever, don't even have it, I'll send it to you anyway. Join our Association of Marian Helpers. You can see our next slide, micprayers.org. Share in these graces. There's no cost. It takes 10 seconds. Please do it. And with that, I'm going to finish now and say God bless you all. Thank you, and let's pray for each other to live in peace and harmony. Amen? Amen. Alleluia. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <laughs>